it's going to be the biggest employer in Central Texas. I think the uh, the effect that Bezos had in Seattle will will be dwarfed by what Elon does to to uh, the future of Austin. So there's a lot of industry coming here besides Elon, but that story is going to be the most robust part of the story of Austin over the next decade. So the question is this, how do most agents find the secrets to succeed in today's competitive real estate market, especially when the top agents are keeping those secrets to themselves? That's the question, and this podcast will give you the answer. Hi, I'm Aaron Amuchastegui, and welcome to Real Estate Rockstars. Real Estate Rockstars, welcome to the podcast. Today, we have got one of my favorite real estate agents in the entire nation, Matt Holm. He's a compass guy, just like me. He's out of Austin, Texas. So Matt has over 14 years of experience in Austin real estate. He brings an absolute wealth of experience and knowledge. He's been named a top 10 agent in Austin out of 16,000 agents. He's in a top 10 agent in 2018, 19, 20, and 21, and uh, is definitely on track to maintain that status here in 22. So absolute real estate powerhouse in Austin uh, with some fascinating ties to not only primary, secondary homeowners, investment, but also Tesla. So you were the founder of the, the Tesla Owners Club in Austin. Is that right? That is right. Thank you for having me. And, and yeah, Tesla was... Uh, not on my radar uh, so much until 2012 when I saw they had a sedan that came out and I, I went to Houston and actually got to see one in person, couldn't drive it. And I went back to the hotel, I was at a conference and ordered it, came back home and finalized the order, had never sat in the car, didn't know what to expect other than looking at a bunch of YouTube videos. And the car arrived in March of 2013 and the car exceeded expectations. My daily driver had been a, a G-Wagon and a 911 Turbo, and I alternated between them and horrible gas mileage, but fun to drive, but always something breaking down. And I get this car that is faster zero to 60, maintenance-free, loved, exceeded expectations. And then the next week I met Elon Musk and I'm like, okay, now I've gone down the rabbit hole. So he had come out and was trying to push for legalization of direct sales in Texas, um, which the franchise dealerships kind of have a stranglehold on and they still have not released it. Uh, but I went and gave rides to press and was super enthusiastic. And at the end of, uh, of this hearing that we had, I sat behind Elon for nine hours waiting on our hearing to come up. He turned around and said, hey, I saw you on the news. Thanks so much for your help. What can I do for you? So, you know, the obligatory selfies and signed my license plate and my my uh, sun visor. And, you know, the guy crackles with intelligence. I get to meet the man himself the first week I own my car. And I'm like, OK, this people need to know about this company and, and what this guy's doing. And so that was the beginning of the club. Yeah, that's phenomenal. When we uh, when we came out and met you a few weeks ago in Austin, we were given not a ton of background on you. It was just like, yeah, he's a top compass guy. He's plugged into Tesla. And we we're like, all right, cool. We walk into your office. You've got the, the Tesla flamethrower. You've got, yeah, I know. You've got the model of the, the truck behind you there. You've got the decanter that, I mean, like you can't buy these things. They're, they're only for people that are on the inside that Tesla's like, hey, you're a friend. We're going to give you cool stuff. Um, so you are, you're definitely the go-to for a lot of different things in Austin. Um, the gigafactory that you took us by was insane. I couldn't see the end of the building. Like the things that Tesla is doing in Austin is just mind boggling right now. Amazing. I mean, that thing is almost a mile long, uh, almost a quarter mile wide. It takes a minute to drive by it at, you know, 70 miles an hour on the freeway, 75. It's 11 million square feet. It, the footprint's 4 million, but it's 80, 80 feet tall in many, many places. And the HVAC space is 11 million square feet. He got it built in 18 months. Elon joked that if he was still in California, he'd still be in permitting. And in the meantime, they're pumping out batteries and Model Ys out of that thing already two years later. So it's uh, it's incredible to see. And, and from what I'm hearing, that's phase one. Um, that they've got roughly 5,000 people there now at full capacity. I'm hearing 28,000. Um, and so it's going to be the biggest employer in central Texas. I think the, uh, the effect that Bezos had in Seattle will, will be dwarfed by what Elon does to, to, uh, the future of Austin. So there's a lot of industry coming here besides Elon, 
But that story is going to be the most robust part of the story of Austin over the next decade. So that was something I really was interested in talking with you about, because when we were touring Austin together, you were like, yeah, that's the Facebook meta building. And those are the Google guys. And these are the Tesla guys. And it was just the who's who's of technology all the way down the list. And uh, we had someone on the podcast recently who said, yeah, Austin's about to fall. <laughs> we have, I, I was Googling, you know, real estate articles in preparation for the podcast. And there's plenty of people that are, oh my gosh, Austin's a housing bubble or this or that negative headline. And I thought, man, I guarantee you, Matt has uh, some serious wisdom to drop on us. So where do you feel like the direction of Austin is headed? So you, you made a good point the, the titans of, of tech, right? And, and really as a nation, what do we produce, right? I mean, do we produce cars and ship them out worldwide? Do we produce widgets? What, you know, we produce technology, right? Apple, Google, uh, Meta, Tesla. These are some of the biggest companies we've got and that we export out this technology and they're moving in droves here. And it's not, you know, I would have described us five years ago as tech light. Uh, we were a lot of back office jobs. We were customer support. We were HR. We were hiring. Um, the zeitgeist shift that we've got that's happening right now is these companies are starting to build millions of square feet, 3 million more square feet for Apple, set for software engineer teams. Uh, almost a million square, new square feet for Google, 4,500 software engineers and corporate jobs coming in. Meta's took, taken over the tallest lease on an office tower downtown. And so we've got what's going to end up numbering in the hundreds of thousands of jobs in tech over the next four to five years coming this way. And the difference is the jobs that, that we used to have in tech were 80,000 to 120,000 entry level jobs, back office. And now your average software engineer out of college makes 180 plus 50 to 70 K in, in Google stock options. As an example, their team leads make five to 700,000. There's an entire vertical village of 4,500 of them coming this way. That building's not done. The meta building is not done. Tesla just got done and is maybe one sixth of the way through the hiring in first phase, right? So this wave of um, jobs that's coming here and high paying jobs is barely starting. And so if you just look at a very simple supply and demand metric, and that's all I care about, I mean, you could talk about, you know, Wall Street Journal had that article, oh, you know, Austin's in for a fall. Well, to me, that's just lazy math. Um, they, they went up the most, it's got to go down the most, right? And what they're not looking at is the underlying metric of job creation. As long as we have more high paying jobs coming here and more humans than we can fill for housing, as much as the government is going to try to tamp down with interest rates, six and a half, seven percent, whatever they get to, it's either going to increase our rental rates, which I've seen 25 percent increase in rental rates in the last 18 months in Austin. And they're, it's getting accelerated now because people are kind of putting their hands in their pocket over the last month thinking rates will come down. And in the meantime, rents are just skyrocketing right now because we have more people moving here than we have houses that we can keep up with. Can you, okay, so I love that you brought the rental thing up because we were talking and you shared with me that you bought a piece of land for the land value. You were going to build something on it. It had an RV or a trailer on it. And you were like, well, maybe I can rent that thing out in the meantime. <laughs> what? Can you just share that story? Because that blew my mind. Yeah, uh, well, there's a couple of bits of pieces. I don't know which one you're talking about. We got some development deals. The, the personal house we bought was a double wide trailer with a view uh, on top of a hill that I was going to scrape and tear down. And uh, and instead, I put a little bit of lipstick on it, paint and some furniture and built a deck on it. And I, that's rented for five thousand a month furnished for a double wide trailer with a view of some water. Um, there's a little house next door to me that's a couple thousand square feet that I was going to tear down eight foot ceilings, horrible choppy floor plan. And instead I put a couple hundred thousand of lipstick on it, furnished it, and I get 8,000 a month for that furnished. So I've sort of found uh, something that's not the wear and tear or the city regulations against short-term rental, but I found the formula here that works for the central properties that I'm focusing on for my, my own portfolio. And if I can furnish them and offer it to corporate relos or people that are building their McMansion that need a place to stay in the school district they want to be at, close drive to downtown, they'll really pay whatever you ask. They care more about convenience than they do what they're spending. And so um, it's finding that particular market. I'm even shocked at the rents that I'm getting. And this stuff is renting in like, you know, a couple of phone calls. Yeah, that's um, it, it's a similar trend in our market too, where we've seen a big influx of people that have extreme amounts of, of wealth and liquid cash. And what I've found in, in working and interacting with those types of people is 
it becomes less about, is this a good monetary investment? And more, is this a good time investment? Because they've already got the monetary piece covered. They're looking for the convenience factor. Like you said, they're looking for lifestyle. They're looking for where are my kids going to go to school? Is my wife going to be happy and be able to go do the things she likes to do? And, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And so I think that's brilliant. It sounds to me like, even though you're right, market went up a bunch, someone could predict a crash just as what goes up comes down. It's logic on that. Sounds to me like what goes up is going to keep going up because you've got a bunch of high paying jobs coming in the area. You've got all these tech companies that have more funding and more affluent resources and reach than any other companies in history. I mean, when you're looking at Apple and Google and Facebook, I mean, they have more reach than anyone has ever had. Their employees are coming to Austin. They're going to need housing. So as an investor who maybe wants to get in before the gold rush really booms, where, where would you point them and what, what would you say? Oh, that's a great question. And, 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 I'm, and I agree, over in the next 10 years, we're going to be one of the hottest markets and the, the tightest markets that we're going to have nationwide, if not in the world, based on the influx of jobs. But in this exact moment, with the stock market doing what it's doing, with interest rates where it's at, it's actually a great time to negotiate price. Um, this has been the first time in probably two years where people have you know, priced it into the ramp up. And now I'm, I'm taking that a little bits off the top. Um, I have one property that I'm in the middle of negotiating. We're getting 800,000 off of a $5 million house that's been on the market for 30 days. So I'm starting to see some of this with people that have to sell. Um, what I'm telling clients is if you don't have to, and I'll teach you my formula of making this a furnished rental. I have a neighbor that got 20,000 a month for their 5,000 square foot house with a tiny backyard and a pool prepaid for two years. So they got $440,000 in rents. So that's, I'm, we're in Westlake. It's just West of town. It's where the compass office is here in, in Austin. Um, it's the closest in with schools that are excellent. You're five minutes to downtown. You've got large houses on large lots. And while it seems counterintuitive to buy an investment property at a price point of one and a half, two million dollars. When those properties are throwing off twenty thousand a month, um, the numbers actually do make sense. And so, and when you're getting an asset that's going to appreciate at, at a faster rate, and that's not just that's that's anecdotal for me. We had a house in Round Rock. We bought in 06. It's come up three and a half uh, times the price it was, and our house in Westlake's gone up six x since uh, two thousand twelve with a remodel. So you know. That's 30 minutes outside of town versus five minutes. The other piece, if you're looking for a, a lower priced one, entry level um, that I think is going to be robust is near Tesla. Um, the Gigafactory is going to have 28,000 people by the time uh, they get the full, full uh, employment 2024, roughly in phase one. Um, they haven't announced it yet, but the assumption is the project they're working across the street from there is SpaceX. You're going to have Neuralink. Um, I think you're also going to find out that Elon is turning more into a software company. So the full self-driving stuff that he's doing, it's a feedback loop with the mothership, interpreting with eight cameras what's happening visually in the world, and then interpreting it and reacting to it. And so really, that's AI software. And I think in the next couple of years, you're going to see robotics and AI and we'll be the epicenter for that based on Elon being here. And he said himself that he thought um, Austin was going to be the biggest boom town in the last 50 years in, in, in the United States. And I don't disagree with him. And, uh, and it's really based on his bringing all the jobs here. But the number of jobs that are coming with the other companies is going to at least match what he's bringing here in sheer numbers and, and actually pay more. Yeah, that's incredible. So Austin is is definitely, I mean, from the sounds of it, headed on the up and up in a very big way. Where do you feel like from a macro perspective, the real estate market's going to head over the next few years with interest rates climbing and et cetera? I mean, obviously not not every place in the US can be as insulated and not everybody has an Elon coming to <laughs> coming to save us. Where do you feel like uh where do you feel like the rest of the market's gonna head? Well, so I do think we're going to they're they're achieving the goal of tamping down inflation. I think by the time they raise rates into the sevens, I think it's really going to 
dampen things down. Um, and so even here, I mean, right, we're seeing some negotiation possible in what was been a two year solid sellers market. And that's a good thing. I don't think it's unhealthy to, uh, to kind of slow down. You can't have 35% appreciation every year. Uh, just not going to make sense. And so there is a window of time when you can buy something. I just hate the rates. So for the first time in 14 years, I'm actually recommending interest only and five, one arms to clients. And what I'm theorizing, and I'm, and I'm using this, uh, um, from data from economists and lenders I know and people who are smarter than me in the loan stuff. And what they're saying is rates are going to go up. It's going to slow things down. It doesn't help with the supply issue. Um, still, it's just artificially holding them down for now. Once they feel like they've cooled it, if they overcool it, then we enter a recessionary period, in which case they take the hammer off of the interest rates. And maybe that happens in a year. Maybe it happens in six months. Maybe it happens in two years. But if you've got a 5-1 arm that's at a 35 or 4% rate instead of 7%, at that point, you refinance into a 30-year fixed, but you've bought at a point when in the middle of what's going to be a pretty robust upcycle, you've gotten in at a, at a window we've got here, I think, summer 2022, when you can actually get a deal. Um, those houses I was telling you about near Elon's um, uh, factory, brand new houses in the five fifty dollars to $600,000 range. Um, and I think once you add 30,000 people five minutes away from these houses, your rents will end up probably doubling in the next 18 months to two years, just based on the sheer volume of humans moving there and how much more affordable being close by the factory on the east side is compared to another 10 minutes closer into downtown where rents are, you know, astronomical. Yeah, that's um, that's a great strategy with the arms. I've been recommending something similar to my clients that are that are worried about the rates and want to try to get into something lower. For for me personally, my thought process has been try to target a seven or a ten year arm because the five year outlook to me just seems so uncertain. Of hopefully it'll stop going up, but the last time this rapid inflationary period happened in the U.S., it was a longer climb than was expected back in the eighties. Yep. And so I guess that's my concern for a client is if you lock into a five year, that's going to be your best terms. You're, you're going to get your lowest interest rate. Yep. But what if in five years you're ballooning up to like an eight or nine percent? God forbid. <laughs> but um, what, what's kind of your thoughts there? I mean, do you feel like that that five year trend is going to hold? What, what's the data you're seeing? I mean, this is this is lenders and people I'm connected with that I feel are more educated than I am. And they're feeling like it's a two year horizon on the outside before we see a little bit of a dip in rates. But you're absolutely right. It could be longer than two years. It could be longer than five years. So a 10-1 arm is still pretty attractive. Um, I locked one last month at uh, 4% on a 10-1 arm with a local bank nice. here, which was not bad. Um, and I'm pretty confident in 10 years you know, Austin will will be a little bit more expensive than it is right now. I mean, we're 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 if you look at and what I use to kind of show people, for example, where we are in Westlake, the equivalent in the Bay Area is the Atherton area, right, uh, or the Beverly Hills area, let's say in in Southern California. And so, if you look at what Atherton and Palo Alto have done since the late '90s and really the beginning of technology, and you see. It's not exactly parabolic, but it's pretty close, right? You had a couple of dips in the tech bubble in the early aughts, and then you had 2008 through 2011. And other than that, it's been pretty steady. Your average home price on the last uh, graph I saw was a million dollar home in Atherton in 99 is now a $20 million home. So that's a 20X wow. in 22 years. I don't know if we're going to be exactly match that, but you know, I do think when you get the titans of tech and all their corporate you know, headquarters and whatever else moving here, we're going to be you know, equivalent pricing or close to it in the next decade. Yeah. And I will say too, thinking back to a conversation I recently had with a friend who's an agent in Jacksonville, they are really connected with a bank down there who has had very accurate predictions over the last decade. I mean, almost they, they put out this annual report every year and yeah. she said they are like scary accurate with how spot on their predictions tend to be for the market. Yeah. Um, and they're, they're looking at a Q4 of this year to Q1 of next year change in the interest rates where they start to, to level off a little bit and then maybe start to come back down through 23, which sounds like it's in line with the same things you're hearing. So uh, my fingers are definitely going to be crossed for that. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and the only challenge at that point is if rates drop down again, then we're back in the same ramp up that we were 
you know, last year, um, unless the Fed comes in and starts raising rent, you know, rates again. I don't know if they'd be willing to do that if they push us back into a little recessionary piece. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. No matter what, I, I don't feel like there's a, a bad moment right now to be in the Austin market. And if you're looking at a five-year horizon, you know, um, 10-year horizon, I think you're you're in a comfortable spot here simply based on our metrics. We're adding, I think we had a 210 people a day last year. Um, I think we'll be closer to 100,000 people coming in this year based on the job metrics of what I'm seeing. It's a lot of people for a town our size. We're 2.2 million people. We're not a huge town. Um, we were a million people back when we moved here 14 years ago. So we've come up, you know, we doubled in 14 years. What I'm seeing is about a million people a decade is what we're going to be pointing towards. So we'll be doubling sometime in early 2030. Those are pretty crazy numbers. Um, and, you know, the biggest challenge I think we're having is traffic, you know, hoping that Elon comes in and puts a metro in. It'd be nice to be a first class city with a first class metro. Um, that would help because our traffic is not getting any better. And, um, you know, there's certain infrastructure pieces that we'll have as growing pains. But all in all, I don't think you're you're going to um, go wrong investing in something in Austin or really Texas in general. I mean, you guys are fortunate in Florida as well. We've both kind of been escape hatch states for people that are just tired of for a variety of reasons of where they're from. And they're continuing to move here, you know, no matter what for jobs and for lifestyle. Yeah, absolutely. We've seen. Uh, massive growth in our market here over the last two years for not only the escape hatch piece, because that was especially big in, in the South Florida hubs of Tampa and Miami and Palm beach, where people were getting out of maybe New York or California and they were flying to those massive South South Florida hubs for us here. We've definitely seen that, that, that we've, we've seen the people moving here full time, but we've seen a huge influx of incredibly affluent people going, you know what? The next time I can't travel outside the U.S., I need somewhere inside the U.S. to go. And we were fortunate enough to have the best beaches in the world. And so we've seen a huge influx of pure second home buyers that are not looking to even rent their property. I mean, it's been fascinating to see, but I think it just goes to show that real estate is such a robust asset to, to bank on long-term because you pull up the 1950s to now housing chart, you want to talk about parabolic? Right. <laughs> it's just a straight line up. Right. Hey, real estate rock stars. This is Aaron Muchastegui, and I'm interrupting myself to bring you this commercial break from one of our sponsors. There's somebody I've been looking at for a long time, and when they reached out to me, I said, yes, we have to be able to do this deal. So that sponsor is Follow Up Boss. There's a lot of superstars out there that use Follow Up Boss. What's your favorite CRM? We're using Follow Up Boss. So we use Follow Up Boss. So we use Follow Up Boss. I love Follow Up Boss. I love it. We have action plans now for bringing on new agents. We have action plans for our recruiting. Uh, we call them action plans and follow up boss, which will trigger tasks for the agents to do as far as calling. Follow up boss, I like more for the integrations with everything, MailChimp, call action, all those different products. I will say we used Sync and we switched from Sync to follow up boss. Honestly, the greatest CRM I've ever used, I've used Brivity Sync. I've looked at Boomtown, like Real Geeks, just a bunch of different ones. But me personally, I fell in love with Fub about like seven months ago when I first started using it. I've used Boomtown. I've used Line Desk. I've used Conversion. And I think Follow Up Boss gives you the most integrations mm -hmm. that are simple. And it gives you the best ability to go and integrate large things into one single solitary platform. Yet at the same time, it's still affordable. I do like Follow Up Boss better just because it you can text from the app and things like that. It's just a little more convenient for me. Um, it tracks everything that I need. I can customize it if I want. If I want to go smart list based, that's fine. If I want to go task based, it's fine. I think it's one of the best systems and it's very user friendly. It just really helps me never drop a ball because it, it's so user friendly. I don't have a one horse in the race with Follow Up Boss, purely objective. Follow-Up Boss has been the best one that we've found. Now, I've used Follow-Up Boss. We've actually used it in our non-real estate businesses as well because it's so good at being able to set timers, set automatic texting and emailing. So here's what we got. For Real Estate Rockstars listeners, you get a 30-day free trial. That's normally 14 days. So in order to get this, you go followupboss.com, just like it sounds, forward slash rockstars. Go there, get your 30-day free trial, and check it out. 
especially if you aren't using any systems or any CRMs yet, this will be a great one for you to start with. Thanks again. Now back to our show. But uh, Matt, I, I, I love um, I love getting to hear your perspective on things. And I'd love to to just hear some of your perspective on you've got such a fascinating story of how you got into the real estate industry. Can you maybe share a, a piece of that and, and maybe just some of those formative moments in the early parts of your career that helped you get to where you are? Yeah. So my background was completely different than real estate. My wife was briefly an agent in California for about five minutes in, in the early aughts. And it was, I think it was 06 and it was really heated. And I think at that point in the state of California, one out of every 20 adults had a real estate license out of, out of 40 million people. That sounds like a crazy number. I don't know if it was accurate. That's what I was told. And uh, let's just say it was a, uh, it was not her cup of tea. She's a absolute amazing person, but she just, it, it was, it was not the market. And so, but I enjoyed it. And I'd go with her on listing appointments and I just kind of learned through osmosis. We'd done a little bit of investing, but I was actually a fourth grade teacher and I was a wedding photographer on the weekends and the wedding photography paid me, you know, 15 X what my teaching did. Cause we had a, a great contract with some venues and had a really great time working together on the weekends. And I, I did my day job during the week. And then in 07, I actually had a hit and run bicycling accident and broke my neck in three places and was laid out for about six months. And, um, you know, I was in my thirties and wasn't thinking about interruption of business insurance or really anything about your mortality. And, uh, and unfortunately we lost everything, but a rental property we had in round rock and just had to sit there and I'm like, Hey, I have my getting my health back. I'm going to try something different. And, had to figure out something. I didn't have to walk around with a camera for eight hours a day because um, I couldn't do that anymore. And um, I came out here and got into real estate. And that was July of, oh, well, licensed in 07, July of 08. I actually came out and started selling houses. And we all know what 08 did, right? So I got out here and I started marketing some homes for new construction. I was going to put up flyers in for new uh, first time home buyers because they didn't have another agent they knew. And I figured, well, I'll talk to them and be the first one to go chat with them and see what we can do. And I sold five homes my first month in the business and thought, well, that seems like a good start. And I sold five my second month. And I've just kind of been a volume guy since then. Last year, I closed 117 uh, homes personally, um, just under 103 million in sales. And, uh, you know, I'm averaging 900,000 a sale. And back then I was averaging hundred thousand a sale. So same volume, just the numbers keep getting bigger. So got into the business, 08 hit. Um, you know, I saw that downturn. I figured out a formula that for me worked. Um, and I essentially what I did is I went to the builders who a lot of times their on sites aren't the most robust salespeople. Occasionally they just sit there behind their, their computers and throw keys at somebody that walks in the door and keep playing solitaire. Not everybody. There's good ones, but I'm just saying they, they're not necessarily lighting the world on fire. And so I threw barbecues and balloons up and down the highway and free giveaways and margaritas and snacks, anything to get the car to stop. And, uh, and these builders appreciated the extra help. And if somebody came in and drank a margarita and didn't have representation and they came in because of my sign, then, then I got a client. Right. And, and so, uh, that was a formula that worked while the builders felt they needed us. Right. And that was something that, uh, you know, I think I told my I've told my agents that work with me when when and if the market changes, those big builders they're not going to turn into Amazon or Google. They're going to build houses. They make their little chocolate chip cookie, and that's all they do. And so they're going to find a way to incentivize selling that chocolate chip cookie. And if we can help them do that, and then you know you can make some money even in a downturn. And so um, it'll be interesting to see what this. I'm calling a flattening out or a vapor lock is where we're at right now. I have yet to see across the board, massive reductions in my listings. And I'm getting, I got two offers today on, on listings before the weekend. So, um, but if it does shift to more of a buyer's market, you know, I have the formula and I think we'll still be, still be moving houses. It's just gonna, the resilient will, will push through and find a way. And so, uh, It'll be interesting to see how this next six months plays out, but I think there's always opportunity in the market. You just have to figure out how it's pivoted and, and how you can adjust. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I remember you telling us that story and the the hustle you had really stood out. I mean, you were definitely going above and beyond and you still go above and beyond. I mean, you took hours out of a busy day that you were literally 
Like you dropped us off at lunch, went and showed a multi-million dollar house, came back, picked us up, toured us around. Like, I mean, you had things to do. You even took us to the airport. I mean, you, you were just so kind. You went out of your way to make sure that we not only enjoyed Austin, but learned about Austin. And so I think that Tony Robbins always says success leaves clues, right? And I think for you that that clue, one of the biggest ones is go above and beyond for people, just treat them the way you'd want to be treated and, and go out of your way. And that's always going to come back to you. Um, so thank you for that. Number one. And number two, when you're working with these buyers in the beginning, do you remember any of what your, your script was or, or some of the things that maybe worked and didn't work that trial and error process. And, you know, how did you figure out not only, obviously you were getting them in the door, but how did you figure out how to close them and get them under contract? So I think it comes from my background in education where you're taking a complex, you know, topic and you're making it simple and digestible. And I feel like my job isn't sales. I don't like being called a salesperson. I feel like I educate with enthusiasm. Number one, I'm in a city I love and I, I am passionate about, and I am extremely bullish on this city and our projections. So it's not hard for me to believe in it. And you got to believe in your product, right? And I believe wholeheartedly in our housing in Austin. I mean, no question, but then I'm not pushing it down somebody's throat. I'm not, I'm not scripting it. What I do is I read the Austin business journal daily. I keep up with every new development, the new hiring, what the companies are doing around town. And I educate my clients to the point where they understand the underlying metrics supporting housing. And by the time I've educated them, and this goes down to the neighborhood we're in, to the age of the house, oh, this was built pre-71, this is going to have potentially lead-based paint and, and, and cast iron plumbing and aluminum wiring and blah, blah, blah. And at each aspect, whether it's breaking down a home, breaking down a neighborhood, breaking down egress, ingress patterns, um, what's going on with companies around the area, what buildings are coming up, well, who's hiring, who's, you know, who's moving out of the area. If you can educate and, and be the expert in your city and you can do it with passion and you can explain to people and take the fear because you've educated them and you've taken what can be very intimidating and giving them a good basis for why they should be investing in that area. The rest does its work. I don't have a bust rate. I don't have a, oh, I'll try to get them in contract and see if they stick kind of mentality. My clients, I'm the glue that makes them stick, but they stick themselves to the deal because they're educated to the point where there's zero question in their mind. That's the house. That's the neighborhood. This is the city. That's the price. And I've done, if I've done my job, they're the ones leading and, and driving the ship on that. And that's the, the, the education background that I take to it, that little mini version I gave to you guys in a handful of hours where we were together, you know, that, that's what I excel in. I love taking investors and clients in town, popping them in my Tesla and driving around and, you know, pulling up the screen and walking through the satellite, you know, where everything is and then driving around town and showing them, hey, you know, here's what traffic looks like this time of day. Here's what's expanding over here. This company's moving here. You know, these guys are up here and who's here's where they're moving. And by the time we spend three, four five hours in a car together, they know the town and they may have thought, oh, I'm going to buy in a year. And pretty soon, you know, we're in contract at the end of the week. And they're like, we felt so well taken care of and so educated about Austin. We felt like we just needed to make a move right now. And I think if you can supply that, whatever your market is, that, that level of depth of knowledge, A, you're the expert and B, those people get extremely comfortable extremely quickly. Yeah, I can tell you it works too, because when you were educating us, I was feeling around for my checkbook. I mean, even, even on the even on the podcast, when you're talking about like, oh yeah, these guys are moving in and this is their base salary and this is where they like to be. And this is going to be the population growth. I was like, I need to get in now. <laughs> I don't want to miss this. Like you're so right where the education piece is, is I, I, I'm the same way. I hate sales people. I hate being sold to. I hate selling, <laughs> but I love to teach. I love to educate. I love to help people. And I think when you seek to serve people with that genuine mindset to the point, even where I, I'm curious if you do this, a lot of my clients, I will, they'll bring me something that they like, and I'll probably find a reason to tell them it's not the right thing because I know what they're looking for. And I know the reasons it will or won't work. Do you ever have those situations? How often does that happen where you're like, actually, I don't think that's right for you? A hundred percent of the time. If I see anything that's a red flag, 
I will point it out immediately. And I've found that's the best way to gain trust. I'm not opening a door and saying, look at the pretty chandelier and, oh, we can paint this color. And that's, I've shown you three houses. Let's lock down on one kind of scenario. I'm taking each house as an opportunity to, to show them the pitfalls or the benefits of that, that area. Right. Uh, and what we're looking at. And I, and I really do feel like if you truly look out for someone else's best interest, they can recognize that people can smell if you're genuine or not. I mean, mm-hmm. I, and, and you know what, it's a better way to be than to walk around feeling scripted. And I'm going to go to this networking group because it's good for this and that. And I'm going to hand my card out to 50 people. And I'm like, no. And I think when you guys were here, I said, and it sounds like maybe a funny business philosophy, but our philosophy on my team, number one rule, fun. If you are a fun person to be around and you're enjoying things, like I love the Tesla club. I started it. We've grown it to a massive membership. We're doing cool things with it. I've never used it as an engine for business. Has it turned into business? Yep. It sure has, right? But I've never led with, hey, I'm Matt Holm, your president and realtor. It's just, hey, I'm here. I'm enthusiastic about this. And so I tell my agents, find something you love. I don't care if it's paddle boarding. I don't care if it's yoga in the park, knitting, do stuff you love to do. Be passionate about what you're passionate about already. And people are going to be like, man, I like this person. What do you do? And then once you've gotten the invite, you can say, well, here's my history. Here's what I've done. Here's who I work with. You know, um, you know, that's what I do. And all of a sudden, like, I like this person. They seem super knowledgeable. I know somebody that wants to work with you, or I want to work with you, or I want to look at investment property. And I've never worn a name badge. I've never even, I don't tell people what I do. I just go around and and I tell my agents, you should always be having fun, sponsoring fun, going to fun. I mean, literally after this, I've got a mixer. And, and by the way, it's fun. That's not necessarily, and I hang out in the office and we have ping pong tournaments and we have fun here, but I tell my agents, the one place I know a new business is not sitting around is in the office, get out and go have fun and be that person that people gravitate towards. And I promise you it'll turn into organic business and you'll feel good about it. And those people will like you genuinely. And then those clients turn into friends. I mean, I'm going to the to the NBA final tonight with two clients who are really more friends than clients at this point. One of them's bought $11 million of real estate with me in the last six months. I'm about to buy him a membership to a private club as a thank you um, for all the business he's given me. But genuinely, I consider them more friends than even clients at this point because we met organically in, in that way. And so, uh, you know, I would just encourage you to be an authentic self enjoy if you enjoy people if you don't enjoy people i think you're in the wrong business i, I love I, i'm i'm with people and i get more energized i get home and i'm pumped up and it doesn't wear me out and i think part of that is personality you can cultivate it too and if you're genuinely having fun in something you like doing you're gonna be more engaged and engaging and and people like to work with people they like that's got that's number one and then you can lead with the rest of the story about how you're actually competent at what you do yeah, a hundred percent. I love that. And I'll I'll say this too. When I am in a mindset of like if I'm around people that I don't click with, and I'm like, oh, I gotta entertain, I've got to be on for these people to to make this interaction pleasant, that drains me. I come home exhausted. When I'm around people that we just we genuinely click, we enjoy it's like you said, your clients become your friends and your friends become your clients. That is easy. That is energizing. I used to think I had to be just like, um, you didn't get to meet him, Brian, our CEO, but like, he's an amazing golfer. He does a ton of deals on the golf course, right? Like, you know, those guys, they, they're very traditional in the way they network. I'm, I'm not that guy. I hate golf. I suck at golf. And I, I felt pressured in the beginning to be that guy that played tennis or golf or something. You know what I love to do? I love jujitsu, which is a one-on-one sport and made no sense to me as a networking opportunity. I love walking on the beach in the mornings and watching a sunrise. You go watch my Instagram. I post a sunrise at the beach almost every morning. The funny thing is I've organically met so many people that click with me. Well, I'll walk down the beach, say hi to someone, pet their dog because it's a cute dog. We'll end up talking. Lo and behold, they own a $5 million house up the street. Like it just happens. You're doing jujitsu. You're talking to a guy, some new guy walks in. Oh, you, you, you're interested in buying a house down here? Well, let's talk. Where are you interested in looking, right? Like, let me just see if I can genuinely help you. I'm not even trying to be their agent. I'm just trying to help them. But they feel that. And then they want to work with you. So that's, I mean, that is brilliant advice. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, it allows you to not have a separate work persona and personal persona. And, 
you know, you don't have to look a certain way or act a certain way. Or, I mean, I, I'm in a t-shirt, maybe I'd throw a jacket on, but in Austin, well, first of all, it's hot outside, but I mean, there is no, at least here, we don't really have a dress code. So I get to be as comfortable as I am in clothing as in my personality, in the way I interact, because I've, I only do stuff I like to do. And so if I'm only doing stuff I like to do, then I'm going to be around people that are enjoying the stuff that I'm enjoying. And, and like you said, it just turns into business in a completely organic way because you're having fun with these other people. And so, um, yeah, no, I, I completely agree. It's just a, it's a better way to be. I, I don't, I don't know. I guess this is good and bad. My wife may say I never shut it off, but there is no separation between business and work for me. Like all business is personal and my clients are my friends. So I will answer a text message at 7 a.m. and at 9 p.m. Some people shut off their their phones. I'm always a resource to my clients, but it's also because they're my friends and I'm going to, you know, if they're, if they're struggling with something, I want to answer that question right away. And so that level of service is organic to me because of the people I'm working with. And I just, I don't work with people that, I don't like, I, I kind of made that rule about five years ago. I worked with the last person that I knew the second I met them, they were going to be a time suck an energy suck. They were never going to be happy. And I used to take it as a challenge. Like, oh, I can win this person over unhappy. People like that are going to be unhappy in everything in life. And guess what? Do you think they're going to have friends you want to work with? Do you want their referrals? Jerks hang out with jerks. Cool people hang out with cool people. Like I want to work with cool people. So I just want to hang out with cool people and, and get their referrals. And then, you know, my business is a lot easier and my clients are so much happier and appreciative because they're just nice people. And, and so that was a, a big lesson. And so occasionally I'll get a random out of the blue, Hey, I got your number from something and I'll meet with somebody for a coffee or take a phone call. And you can tell pretty quickly, like, are we going to jive? Is this per, you know, what, where are we on this? And, uh, and I will, I will delicately bow out if I get the, this is going to be a person that's just a challenge in life in general. And so that was a powerful, powerful thing for me. Um, and I, and then once again, I think it, it gives me legs in the business. I'm, I'm not burned out after 14 years and almost 1400 transactions. Like I feel as energized as I did day one. And, you know, I've, I, I do okay financially and it's, it's not because I even pay attention. I mean, my bank account stays full. I'm not that great at keeping track of that stuff. Luckily, my ops people, I'll keep an eye on that. And my wife looks at it occasionally. But like, I just know if I'm in front of people helping somebody, it turns into cash somewhere. I don't focus on, is this my $10 million listing or is this my $500,000 first time home buyer? Like, where, where are we at on that? And um, and and yeah, anyway, it's it's it just makes it easy for me because I'm I'm the same person helping people. Like you said, you're serving people. That's your job. Yeah, a hundred percent. And it brings you a greater satisfaction too. When you, when you work with people you enjoy, it's so it's, it flows so much easier. You can service so many different people too. Like that's what I've found in my own business. When I have those people I don't click with or that they're just time vampires, it'll keep you on the phone for two hours. And you're like, you didn't even get a word in for two hours. They just talked about everything under the sun. And you're like, okay, <laughs> I got to do other stuff. <laughs> I used to feel like I couldn't let go of that business because I, I needed to make the sale. I, I Like you, it's a challenge. I'll just grind through it. What I've realized over time is when I give myself the freedom to let go of the people that we don't click well, or maybe they're a time vampire I, I give myself the ability to open up to like five to 10 new people that I actually really love to work with, that I really click with, and that we're probably going to do multiple deals with over the course of our, our friendship and, and partnership together, right? So it's actually been infinitely more productive for me to kind of reverse my mindset and, and give myself the freedom to, to not work with someone. Yeah. Yeah. And it's hard, I think, initially. And, and I sympathize with folks and they're like, well, that's because you've been in 14 years and your clients just shower you with more business. But, you know, and, and I get that my first five years in the business, I woke up feeling unemployed every day. I'm like, well, I had a good month last month. I have no idea how I did it. I guess I'll get out there and put flyers on apartment doors or whatever worked last week or last month. And I'll just keep, you know, just keep moving, you know, essentially. And I think my first five years, I took everything that came my way and I worked everything just as hard. And, and like I said, you just, you get to a point luckily where it just became after about five or six years, I started getting those referrals coming back and realized, Oh yeah, these people are going to want to buy and sell and their friends are going to want to buy and sell. And there's a rhythm to it. And I, I, I really want to cultivate these people that I loved and the people that I loved and that love me are going to bring me 
fantastic business. And, uh, and yeah, no, it's, it's, it's been good. And I try to teach that to my agents going forward. Like I said, you're, you're fun. You take care of the people you hang out with only hang out with cool people. And, uh, and the rest takes care of itself. That's the truth that really, and, and by the way, guys, if you ever go to Austin, you meet Matt or, uh, or any of his team, they are seriously, they're the chief fun officers of the compass office is what we call them because they are fun. Um, but I, I want to, I'm going to kind of out myself here on something that, that hindered my business for the first probably two, three years, at least. I was very much, it was like you, I woke up unemployed. I was like, oh, okay, I did a deal last month, but where's the next one coming kind of thing. And I was so focused on the next deal, the next transaction, I became very transactional. I lost sight of their relationships. And it was like, once closing happened, I kind of dusted my hands and was like, all right, on to the next one. Hope you enjoy your house. And I'm very ashamed of that now looking back, but I never got referrals. And everyone would always tell me like, oh yeah, I'm such a referral based business. And I think, my gosh, what am I doing wrong? Well, what I was doing wrong was I wasn't actually caring about people. I was making money and, and not, not focusing on the people. And so when I started following up regularly after closings and, and being relational and just caring for the sake of caring, not because I was going to make a sale, ironically, it led to way more sales. Did you ever have a moment like that in your business where it was more transactional and then you kind of made a switch and realized, or, or was that just me? hundred percent. It was probably why the first five years I woke up feeling unemployed because I wasn't thinking about the past plan. I gave him a hug. I brought him a bottle of champagne, high five them, said, congrats on your new home. Okay. Next, you know, and same exact thing. And it was a few years down the road, maybe four, um, I started getting calls from people like, Hey Matt, um, you know, we don't know if you remember us. We, we would love to work with you. I don't know if you're still in the business anymore, but you know, we want to sell our house and buy something else. And a light bulb went off. I'm like, Oh crap, I've closed hundreds of people now and I haven't stayed in touch with any of them. And it was transactional, right? And and so that was a light bulb moment. And then I think I got some kind of CRM, barely knew what the word CRM, you know, meant and never entered any data for like two years. But I but I owned it. I paid 40 bucks a month for this thing. It's only as good as what you actually put the data in for and what you do with it. But I had I had that. So baby steps. Took me getting my first assistant probably seven, eight years into the business. And that was life changing because I thought I needed to stay up until two o'clock every morning amending things and doing every piece myself. And the fact is, I rarely touch a computer these days because I have staff to touch computers for me. My my highest, best use is being out having fun and cultivating yeah. new business and making new friends. And so, um, yeah, I 100% was transactional out the gate. Same exact thing. And I think that's probably when you learn to make it personal and you make it less transactional, It's it opens up a whole different avenue. And that's what I try to teach new agents that are coming on is exactly that. How do you, right out the gate, do the stuff you love to do, make it personal, and, and grow your business organically from day one, and not dial for dollars, or have a script, or pay for Zillow leads, or any of this stuff where, I mean, if I had to have a whiteboard, Glen Gary, Glen Ross style, and, you know, dial for dollars and, you know, dial whatever, 2%, 3% conversion rates. Oh my God, I'd never last in the business. It's not something, and you're, you're taking food off your own table long-term. These people are paying for these leads that are BS anyway. You've got a, whatever minimal conversion rate, you're calling people that don't want to talk to you. They have no interest in you personally. You're just a, a name and a number, right? And there you do this work for them and then they disappear. Or they go with another agent, they walk into an open house and they buy with that agent or something happens. And I see that people complain about that. Well, it's because you're not investing personally. You're paying for a lead and you're you're transactional. And so it's not the way to grow a business that I would want to stay in. And I think making it personal as organically as it kind of happened, complete game changer for me. And I just, you know, I have more fun. A hundred percent. And so I'm going to ask you a tough question. Because I'm I'm genuinely curious to know your answer to it. For you and I who've been doing this a while, keeping in touch with the database and creating a referral-based business, relationship-based business, it's easy enough because we have those past sales to fall back on to call those people. What would you tell a new agent who's like, man, I'd love to do that, but I literally haven't made a sale or I've had one sale. Where do you start as a new agent to begin to build relationships? 
Yep. Well, first off, you need to build your expertise. That's a given, right? So like I said, I delve into and daily read the business journals. Every, every city's got one. So you have to, you have to have some, some, some little nuggets at your fingertip, you know, uh, Google's finishing six months away from 4,500 jobs in an 810,000 square foot building. And it's going to be, you know, the largest hiring of, of uh, software engineers in one location in Austin. And it's the beginning of a trend of all these movements. And this is all data that's in my head because, I read about it all the time. So that's first of all, you're going to have those nuggets to drop. Then you're going to go and have your fun. You're going to go uh, out with friends to golf or to happy hour or paddle boarding or yoga in the park or whatever. And when you're having a conversation with somebody and they're like, oh yeah, I work at Google. Oh yeah. I heard you guys, you know, are doing this, that, and the other. Oh wow. You know a lot about our company, you know, and it leads to you being an expert in the city in general. I think that's vital. And then people will, guaranteed ask you, well, what do you do? How do you know this much? Are you a reporter or, you know, what's your background? And so it goes back to immediately, it's not too early to just go and and have fun and sponsor fun. So one of the things I do to stay in contact with folks is I have parties. I have a music event space I have downtown. I have uh, the Tesla Owners Club and we throw events and I will invite my clients who have Teslas and don't have Teslas. I'm like, yeah, come to any party that I've got. And so when I send out an invitation to friends, they know it's, it's not, Hey, you know, your business is my highest compliment. Please send me all your, you know, it's not asking for business. It's sponsoring something that's either helpful. Let me help you fight your property tax or recommend an attorney that can do it. Don't forget to homestead, you know, whatever, or Hey, come to my party. And so that's my, I enjoy throwing parties. I like being a host. I like, you know, live music and, all kinds of fun stuff. And so that's what works for me. Everybody's going to have something a little bit different, but I think it starts in the same place. Go have fun, be knowledgeable about your city. And, and that's the best way I can, I can say doing it. I just, I hesitate to give anyone the advice to start paying for leads or go to a team where they're just going to drop leads in your lap, which people think is going to happen. It's not the same as growing your own leads. And, and it's a lot more rewarding and fun. I can tell you too, as an agent that had some leads dropped in my lap when I started, you know, that I had that we had a, like a sign call program where if someone didn't answer a sign call in our company, they'd hand you a sheet of those unanswered calls, which were kind of like somewhat warm leads, right? They had at least inquired on a property, hadn't spoken to someone. So you can reach out and say, Hey, let me answer your questions. If you don't have any expertise in your market space, I don't care if you talk to a million people, you're going to be lucky to make one sale. And so I think getting that education on your particular market and then expanding that education out to the real estate market as a whole, because they're going to want to have those conversations about what's going to go on nationally. What do you, where do you think the economy is headed and the real estate market is headed? If, if, if new agents can just go and download, you know, the, the wall street journal business section or get a local, a local spot in your city. That's, that's putting out that information, go pull previous data trends of, Hey, how many properties closed in 2017 and 2018, 2019, what were those average sales prices like before I was in the market? If you can just build these little nuggets of knowledge that you can drop on people, like you were saying, you become such a trusted advisor in their mind And you don't have to sell anything. You don't have to script anything. You don't have to gimmick anything. You just go out there, you go try to help some people. You make sure that you're educated in your space and they will naturally do business with you because they trust you. Yep. Yep. hundred percent. That's, that's exactly it. And, and it sounds too easy, right? It's like, wait, you're saying, go have fun, read a business journal, hang out with people organically drop nuggets like you're an expert on the city. Really? It's that easy? And But it is like one of my agents actually at the time she had the biggest sale for the uh, the brokerage for our for our subset of the brokerage three years ago, something like that. Um, she loves live music and her boyfriend helps organize some of these live music events. I'm like, so who's got the money at the live music event? I don't know, the owner of the music event uh, itself, you know, and the musicians. And so I'm like, go hang out and go do that live music stuff. Well, they became friends with the owner of some music event, uh, events around town. And, uh, and he's like, Oh, I want to buy a house on Lake Austin. Well, we went out and and she actually went out of town to take care of some family stuff. And I helped with this purchase that he had it happened to be March of 2020. So the market was like in 
confusion, right? Because it was the beginning of COVID. And we were the first people in the door. And I, I took the agent and I shook her hand and I said, we want this one. Here's the price. Don't show anybody else. I'll have it in your in your hand in, in 20 minutes. And in the meantime, I was also telling her, you know what's going on? She did, she was, it was so early in COVID. She was like, oh, should we be shaking hands and talking? And like, you know, I'm like, oh, you know what's going to happen? This whole market's going to just freeze and drop. Uh, because, I mean, we all thought that early March of 2020. It was a little bit of education of what's potentially going to happen with COVID that I was hearing. But it also really helped me say, hey, take $6 million for this property on a handshake, and she took it. Now, that house had been on the market three years beforehand for $11 million, didn't sell, dropped down to about $9 million, sat there. We got it for $6 million. We all know what happened after March of 2020. It did the opposite of what we thought initially in 2020, where we thought the market was going to drop, and instead it picked up. Well, within six months, that client got offered $9 million from that same agent that sold us to it, or, uh, it to us, and then three months later, $11 million. And last month, Stacy told me that they got offered verbally $18 million for a property they bought in March of 2020 for $6 million. And so, um, you know, that's one of my agents doing stuff she loved, hanging out at music events, dancing and having fun and drinking with these, these folks and whatever she was, you know, hanging out and doing and converted it into the biggest sale that we had at the time. And if she sells it for $18 million, awesome, right? And, and that's taking the exact advice we just talked about and just doing something you like doing. Yeah. And I think too, even I was just, your story reminded me of someone on my team. He used to run a beach chair service before he got into real estate and he would meet a bunch of people down there while he was setting up the chairs and he became friends with some of them. And that became his initial sphere of influence, so to speak, to contact when he got into real estate well, it just so happens that one of those guys that he set a chair up for and became good friends with ran one of the largest timeshare companies. He, they would buy people out of their timeshares and made a ton of money reselling timeshares. And he was, you know, multi, multi, multi millionaire with a bunch of zeros on the end. Well, he sold him a house for $14 million within about 12 months of having his license. That guy then got an offer six months later for $20 million on that same house. He said, I'm insulted. That's too low. <laughs> and so, so my buddy just listed this house on the market for $27.5 million. And the guys owned it maybe, maybe 18 months. But I think that's another good thing for young agents to do is just leverage. If you did anything before real estate, I don't care if you were a stay at home mom and you had friends in the neighborhood, you'd hang out and your kids would hang out. Yeah. Those are, those are potential clients. Like go educate them on real estate at the next play date. Go, you know, anyone you used to hang out with, they probably need a house. We all do. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Now yeah. people, people have to sleep somewhere. And, and I mean, that goes back once again to the Austin metrics that I'm looking at. I mean, we, we built 50,000 new homes last year. The bulk of those were an hour outside on the periphery where the bigger builders can find hundreds of acres and they can just, you know, rinse and repeat on their, on their floor plans. And, and the infill stuff is, is tough to build in Austin. And, and yet we saw 30,000 more than that, 80,000 people move here. So we're already running at a deficit. And that's assuming nobody trades within Austin. Um, and so, you know, at this point, you know, maybe we'll do 55, 60,000 homes this year. But I think you'll end up seeing about 100,000 people move here. So we're going to be, you know, that, that new inventory is still trailing. And, you know, from what I understand, it seems to be a trend across markets. Um, supply is an issue in a lot of major cities. Um, and so I think, you know, we're going to come out the other side of this, whatever this thing is. I'm calling it vapor lock still, but we'll see what it turns into. But, uh, you know, the, the hammer of rates and the stock market puking and all the rest of the fun stuff going on. We're going to be fine. We're going to be fine. And, you know, you may have to pivot. I'm I'm talking to buyers more so than sellers right now. And, you know, that's a slight pivot. And, but I'm, I'm calling them because I'm like, Hey, you were in the market. You put the brakes on, you were tired of getting beat out six months ago. It's not the same world anymore. Here's how you can keep the interest rates down. Now's the time to get out and shop. And so, you know, already just making sure, and I've always been balanced between buyers and sellers. I've never just been listing or just been buyers. And, and I'm happy that I, I do that because it allows allows you to adjust depending on, you know, where's the market and, and what's the best advice you can give. And I'm not trying to get sellers to list with me right now. It's not a great time. I'm trying to get buyers to buy because it's the time to buy in this little window. And so, you know, it it's the advice 
I would give my parents. It's the advice that I would give my sister. So it's the advice I give to my clients. And, you know, it doesn't always make you money. I took three uh, properties recently that just we weren't getting deals on and we put them into the furnished rental portfolio. And my clients are now making, you know, one's 13,000 a month, one's 20,000 a month, I told you about. Um, and I mean, it's the rents, the furnished rentals are great and it's a great way to make money on your property right out and wait for the seller's market to pop back when rates come down. And just remember who made you that extra money, who told you to wait, who didn't try to just grab the quick listing and make a quick buck and take the listing and then have you drop a hundred thousand a week until it sells and all this, you know, stuff that everybody else is going to tell. Not that many agents are going to tell you, don't, don't make me any money. Well, I'll help you in two years when you can make a bunch more, you know, but it's the advice that I know that I would want and that I'm seeing in their particular cases. And that client is now a client for life because I've put them above me making a penny. Um, and I don't even take any money. I give them the formula on how to do this furnished rental and tell them where to, I'll help you market it, but I don't do property management. Good luck to you. Or here's people you can call if you want to. I don't want a piece. Just please call me back and pay me full 3% when you can make a million dollars more in your house. That'd be awesome. You know? Yeah. A hundred percent. I mean, I think if, if agents could step out of identifying as a real estate agent and start identifying as a real estate advisor, and regardless of if it's going to lead to a sale, just give people good advice. That is a client for life who will refer you person after person. I've got a client that I've known for five years and I consider him a good personal friend at this point. He has not bought anything. <laughs> he has looked in this market for five years. He felt like he missed the boat because he saw the prices pre-COVID, post-COVID. And he's like, oh man, I just missed out. But you know what? I told him, I'm like, dude, if you never buy anything, I'm here for you. I'm here for you. I just enjoy talking to you. I enjoy helping you in this market, whether it's five years, 10 years or never that you end up buying. I'm here. We're, we're friends. And he has sent me some of my best clients over the years. Because we've just built that genuine trust. He knows I'm not going to try to talk his buddy into a bad deal. Yep. And so I, I think that's really what you're saying too. And that's so powerful. Um, earlier, you were talking about the inventory shortage. And I love you because you gave me the, the easiest layup ever for a, for a transition here. You guys have one of the coolest projects I've ever seen in the real estate space Please tell us more about this, this uh, affordable housing solution that looks like Elon Musk and Apple had a baby um, and is somehow ridiculously affordable, ridiculously strong, ridiculously safe. Like it's, it seems like the perfect house, to be honest. Like I was blown away. Give us some details. Yeah, it's exciting. So, so uh, uh, my business partner, Ann Warbeck, and myself both got invited to be the last of the founders about a year, year and a half ago in a company called New Community, N-E-U, community.com. Um, and effectively, they were looking to ramp up sales. They were looking at, you know, wanted to, wanted to find out, okay, we've built this thing. We think it's cool. Can we sell it? And so what this is, is it's a cube of steel that's 80 square foot footprint, 10 feet tall, uh, 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 skyscraper glass, and aluminum extrusions that connect them. So, so think about the rigidity of what comes usually from a foundation, right? That it's sitting on. Instead, that comes from this, this, this cube. And this cube is like a, a Lego that can be, you can add to any of the sides. So including top and bottom. So all four sides, top and bottom, you can go three stories tall with them. You can put them on pylons and support them. For example, if you have a house in the floodplain or on the water at the lake and you can't build in the floodplain, you can raise it up and put it on pylons. It's supported by these uh, four discs, one at each corner that also have about six inches of play in case you need to adjust it. And, and really you can build on the edge of a hillside. You can, you can really build anywhere. And so we've um, purchased about 3,500 acres in Austin in the last uh, year and a half closed on all of it are starting our manufacturing in Bastrop. Of course, we went through, um, you know, some supply chain hell and we're still coming out the other side of it, trying to get all the pieces together, but we're, we're there now. And effectively, this is all the materials you put into a skyscraper in these little cubes. And so we can sell the least expensive one for under $200,000 with the dirt. And it's four units, so 320 square feet with a bathroom module, a bedroom module, kitchen module, living room module. Snap them together 
and they come together in a day after they come out of the factory. They're seven and a half feet wide, so they'll actually fit inside of a container, not be a wide load like a mobile home. And they've been tested. There's a 900-page document we have out of California. It was tested for earthquakes. They had a jet engine blowing a fire hose into the into the aluminum extrusion uh, attachments, which is uh, to make sure you know it could hold together. And so it's it'll last longer than any of the sticks and bricks homes that you see around here. And it's factory built. And so when you talk about modular homes, it, you mentioned it's kind of like Elon Musk, you know, got into housing. It kind of reminds me of Tesla's story, right? Because pre-Tesla, if you said, hey, I got an electric car, people would be like, what do you got, a Prius or a golf car? Like, what kind of piece of junk electric vehicle with a two-mile range? Like, you know, who cares? And then all of a sudden, Elon Musk comes out and makes it sexy and fast. And, you know, and it's a great car, man. I'm, I'm on Tesla number six. I'm a full sucker for that. I am hate depreciating assets, but I can't stop buying his product. Um, and so he's taken something that was not sexy, right, electric vehicles, and made them sexy and is moving that into a, a different space. And so when people think of modular, you think maybe boxable. Boxable is fine, but it's pretty flimsy if you know, you know, kind of snaps together and unsnaps. Um You've got mobile homes, which also, you know, don't stand up well to heavy winds and, and really don't have much life in them. And we're taking something incredibly robust and also uh, super exciting to look at. It looks like, you know, the Jetsons. I mean, they're these steel and glass cubes that are super futuristic looking. And so they engaged uh, Anwar Beck to do the marketing. We we actually reached out and he helps me run the Tesla Owners Club as well and also works with me in, in Compass here. And so we went and said, okay, wait a minute. Tesla has no marketing budget. Tesla's, you've never seen a Super Bowl ad. It's it's all through word of mouth within the community and proselytizing from past owners who are just excited about their product, right? And so we tapped into some of these same friends of ours that are in the Tesla community and said, hey, there's this really cool product coming out here. Um, you know, come out and do a video with us or come out and, you know, take a look at it. And if you want to, you know, record it and put it on your YouTube, great. And so we did that and we started the sales campaign. We got the website up and running. And in 65 days, we had pre-orders of 3.5 billion. And we had to turn down the sales, the sales volume a little bit and stop and say, okay, good. We're done for a minute because now we have to figure out how to fulfill them. And these were with very small deposits, but these were reservations with deposits. And so that allowed us to go to investors and say, hey, I think we got something here. I'm pretty sure people like this, right? And really we focused on Austin and 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 kind of people within the Tesla influencer space. And so, uh, you know, at this point we kind of said, please be patient with us. We're gonna get this thing up and running. And it's, uh, you know, COVID was really tough. I mean, our aluminum extrusions we were getting out of Germany. We now get out of Dallas, which is great. We're taking some of this stuff that would have been you know, foreign and now we're making it domestic. So it's forced us to do that because shipping from Germany went up 10 X. Couldn't, couldn't get that in, couldn't get the, the, the glass that we needed out of Europe as well. That was getting too expensive. And so we found sources within the United States. We're paying a little bit more, but it's actually less than if we were bringing it in from other places. And so I feel good about it because we're creating three football field size tents that we're having dropped in 45 days at our Bastrop uh, community. That'll be our manufacturing. We're kind of taking a page also from Elon's book. When he ran out of space in Fremont, he put up tents said, okay, start putting cars together in tents. We're out of space. So, so we're taking these tents. We can drop them and start assembling. Um, and so we've got 1,400 acres, about 12 minutes from Giga Texas, which is the Tesla factory. And the goal is we create affordable housing. We create workforce housing. And because it's truly factory built, an assembly takes one day to clip it together. Uh, you know, we can we can scale and we can get to a point where we can actually start fulfilling some of these supply issues. And so it's it's been a really interesting ride, uh, a little bit frustrating, but coming out the other side of supply chain issues um, and, and solving that now we've got our uh, did you guys go by the, uh, the the Pflugerville warehouse we've got with our, our first delivery in there? Or did we get there? No, I wish. I wish we did because we were like in and out. You know, we had a we had a flight later that day we had to catch. But I mean, that project blew me away. When you're saying it's Jetsons and Elon Musk, how it, how he made electric cars sexy again, it looks so clean. Like you showed me one of those uh, three story mock ups that you guys have that you've done, like a, a drawing, a draft of one. It was every bit as cool and modern and beautiful as anything you might see in Palo Alto. 
but it was a fraction of the cost. It was 10 times more durable than almost anything else, even remotely comparable. Like you said, you can assemble it almost instantly. I mean, it literally, to me, it's, it's like, it's like how iPhone revolutionized the cell phone world where before I had an antenna and a text, I had to press the letter eight three times to get a V. And now all of a sudden I've got a screen with apps on it and a camera built in. And like, that's how this feels to me in the housing space. Yep. I, I would, I would a hundred percent agree. And and we're just so you know, we're not available to go put in your backyard as an, as an office or to put on your lot yet. We are scaling up communities first. And so something a little bit unusual and a little bit more to, uh, to do with, uh, like you said, Apple and the ecosystem Apple created, right. With all the apps and the music and all the rest of it, we're creating communities um, where we're going to have, as an example, a four pod, that's going to be a grab and go store. And we're going to assemble that. And we're going to have, we're going to pull the people that are in that section of the community and say, if you had to get up at nine o'clock at night and run to the store, what do you, what do you need? Oh, I need a lactose free 2% milk. I need diapers for a nine month old. I need, you know, whatever. And then we're able to put those into those stores. You're able to go in and swipe your card, go in, grab the stuff that you need and go back to your house. We've got biking and, and walking trails, um, only electric vehicles allowed within the community, parking outside for anything non. Um, but we're encouraging really people to interact with each other, to create uh, a really different kind of ecosystem and neighborhood where there's organic ways for neighbors to interact and meet on bikes and walking and, and lots of nature around us. So we're not doing the typical clear every tree and put a, you know, you get your five foot tree in your front yard and your little fence backyard and that's it. Our fencing is nature between these builds. So think like, you know, the Jetsons meets Avatar, right? I mean, you're, we're, we're, we're in nature. We're kind of bonsai clipping the nature where that site is going to be. And then your natural buffer between your neighbor is trees and shrubs and, you know, and, and so it's, it's, it's really pretty amazing. Get to the website if, if you get a chance and, and feel free to share that link. Um, but yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun and we're about to start ramping up on actually going to con full contracts and looking at deliveries, you know, within probably seven to nine months. Well, you just call me when you need a test delivery in Florida, because I will definitely gladly uh, be the be the test pilot down here. Uh, well, listen, Matt, I appreciate your time, man. I've kept you way too long, but you have been so incredible, so helpful, so informative. Um, if people want to reach out to you or better yet, send you some Austin based referrals, where can people reach you? So our website is hometeamaustin.com, H-O-L-M, my last name, hometeamaustin.com. But really the best way, and I don't mind giving it out, I'm, I'm generous with my time, my cell phone, 512-769-1695. Uh, you can reach me directly. Um, if you have questions, if you like to chat about some of the stuff we talked about, if you have a client for Austin, great. But if, if you're just like, hey, this guy seems like he's doing something all right, I'd, I'd like to pick his brain. Great. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn. I, I post stuff about Austin on there. But like I said, I look at all businesses personal. So I, I give my number out all over all over the place and and I meet really cool people. And, you know, I'd love to be able to share and help people that are out there wherever you are in 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 your career. Um, I think there's there's the pie is infinite. There is enough for all of us out there. There's a way to enjoy your day to day. There's a way to structure your life where you know, your work doesn't feel like work anymore. And I really feel like I've hit that where I truly do stuff I like to do, including talking to you right now, Caleb. But like, I mean, I just go from event to event to event of enjoying people. And uh, yeah, it's it's a good way to live. But yeah, feel free to call me. Um, email Matt Sells Austin at Gmail. Um, and uh, yeah, I'd love to love to hear from any of you. Well, Matt, thank you so much. Real Estate Rockstars, we appreciate you and we will talk to you next time. See you guys. All right, Real Estate Rockstars, this is Aaron Muchastegui jumping in again to thank you for listening to the show. Hopefully you guys loved listening to that one. And I wanna make sure that you know about all of the extra resources that we have. And also we need your help. They say podcasts are free. You get to listen to podcasts for free. But what is the cost of that podcast? I would say if I could beg you to pay anything for that podcast, I would say the cost of the podcast is going and giving a review. 
So whether you download it on Google or Apple or YouTube or anywhere else, please go give us a review. Say what you liked, what you didn't like. It helps us get better guests. The more reviews, the higher we get in the rate rankings. Right now, we are the biggest podcast out there for real estate agents. And we want to keep that spot because we know there's lots of podcasts out there. So go give us a review. Also, be sure to go to hybendigital.com. If you liked any of the resources that those real estate agents talked about, we've got a huge video vault of those resources for free. Every penny that comes on the podcast that we interview, they give us something that helps them get their deals or helps them work with their clients. And we put that in the toolbox in our vault for you. So go to hybendigital.com and you can get it. If you're looking for real estate education, go to rebusuniversity.com. We have all sorts of courses in there to help agents succeed in real estate, how to get the listing, how to negotiate deals, you know, how to become an investor, all sorts of different stuff, rebusuniversity.com. And if you want to chat with me, go find me on Instagram. And if you come find me on Instagram, you can send me messages. Tell me what you want to hear. Tell me what you liked, what you didn't like. We try to put a bunch of content out there too. You can find me in two different places. It's at rerockstars.com for our real estate rockstars page or at erinamuchastegui.com for my personal Instagram page where I can chat with you about all sorts of different things. Thanks for listening. We'll see you again soon.